Welcome to episode 11 of Ernie's Journey, uh, Capture and Torture in December 1920. So where is Ernie now? He's left Tipperary where he was an organizer for a couple of months. He's back in Dublin working uh, under Michael Collins in the headquarters and uh, they're in the process of reorganizing uh, the IRA. Uh, Ernie is part of that process and the, and the thinking. but. Um, before he takes up a, a new assignment, he is asked one particular assignment by uh, Richard Mulcahy and Michael Collins. Now, they've noticed that the British have been sending in more troops and uh, more auxiliaries. And the auxiliaries have been established in regional areas around Ireland. And one of them is in Woodstock House in Kilkenny. And they think that <clears throat> by uh, attacking such an oddly and newly established place, it probably doesn't have the regular fortifications which some of the other places have. And so it'll be an element of surprise. So uh, they want Ernie to take over the, that assignment. Uh, he goes down, and we're talking about early December now, uh, he goes down to Kilkenny, he works with the local commandant uh, O'Hanrahan, he stays in his house, uh, talks to people, uh, gets plans together, reviews the uh, scene uh, of um, uh, the house, uh, Woodstock House, and starts plans. In the midst of that, however, he is captured. Uh, the soldiers come up the lane, uh, there is uh, no one to warn, and he is caught red-handed. So his books, guns, uh, notebooks, and maps are all on the table and captured. In fact, there is a a uh, record sheet uh, showing uh, the date of his capture on December 9 with all of his equipment and all of the O'Hanrahan family who have been arrested with him. He is taken uh, to Kilkenny. He identifies himself as Bernard Stewart. That will be his alias in this period. Um, he is then transferred from Kilkenny to Dublin. And in Dublin, um, he's in a holding cell, a subject uh, waiting to a interrogation. The British admin have brought over to Ireland a whole new slew of talent. Um, interrogation officers who have had experience during the First World War on German prisoners. They've also had recent experience in Dublin on Irish prisoners, uh, some of whom were killed by them. So, and Ernie had heard of that. Anyway, uh, they start into their interrogation process. This is Major William King and Captain J.J. Hardy. And Ernie O'Malley in his On Another Man's Wound describes this process. What's your name? asked Major King. Stuart. Your Christian name? Bernard. What are you? A farmer. Where do you live? In Innersteeg County, Kilkenny. But you don't live there? No. Where do you live? No reply. Take off your coat, he ordered. I took off my coat. He saw the cardigan jacket. Where did you steal that military cardigan? I bought it. He came over, clenched his hands, and struck me over the heart. Where did you steal the cardigan? I bought it. He struck me in the face. With the full weight of his body, I fell to my knees. Get up! Who gave you the gun? No reply. Are you going to answer? No. He struck me again in the face and blood began to flow into my mouth and drop onto the floor. Captain Hardy, where do you live? I will not answer. Why? Because if I did, you would burn my mother's house, and I am her only son. But we wouldn't burn. Well, houses have been burned, 
and I'm ready to suffer rather than have her suffer. So you are ready to suffer, said the king. He struck rights and lefts to my face and body. I wiped the blood from my face with the back of my hand. Place your coat on the floor, he said. We don't want blood. I did so. Turn around, said Hardy. I turned around. Do you see these photographs? Yes, I said, looking at the wall. Well, some of them refused to give information, and they are dead now. Will you answer me, said King. Where do you live? I did not answer, and he hit me again and knocked me against the wall. Another incident in this tale of interrogation is how uh, Captain Hardy, in the effort to get information out of him, takes uh, some hot pokers out of a uh, fire and applies them to his eyes. Uh, not directly onto the eyeballs, but quite close to them. And so, for the rest of his life, his uh, eyesight was impaired. And he describes how uh, his uh, eyes uh, wept, how his uh, eyebrows were singed, and certainly that must have severely hurt him. Because um, I know from my own experience driving later that uh, he often referred to that um, period. Um, so, one of the things that is happening now is that there's another incident of, in effect, torture, uh, where Hardy has another idea. We call it Russian roulette. He walked over to a desk near the table, took a Webley 45 service revolver from a drawer. Do you know what this is? I nodded. Now watch. He broke the action and spun uh, the cylinder on either side, showing me the lead points and the base of the cartridge. You see? It's loaded. I watched the six cartridges. Get up against the wall. I backed up until I was touching the wall. I'm going to give you three chances. If after the third you don't answer, your brains will be on the wall. He spoke slowly. Who gave you the automatic? One. No answer. Two. He slowly cocked the hammer. I looked along the bluish barrel. My legs twitched in shivers at the ties. I brought my heels together with a snap. Three. I stood stiff. He pressed the trigger. There was a bang. He had a, used a blank cartridge. I mean, what an impact uh, on, on thinking that you were about to die uh, for refusal to give information, and yet you're still alive. So, uh, that certainly, and, and indeed, you know, had his brains been blown out, I wouldn't be here. So, I mean, these incidents are really very personal to me. So, another aspect of uh, Ernie's writing, uh, and indeed his whole character, throughout his memoir and his incidents is the way that he looks at people. And people are individuals. Um, they might happen to be on one side of a fight or the other. And he tells an interesting story that it goes on on Christmas Day. So the three prisoners are taken out of their dungeon uh, and brought up uh, to uh, the mess uh, at Dublin Castle. And here's what happens. When we'd eaten the Christmas pudding, the section commander turned to the Kilkenny man. Do you drink? He filled his glass and that of the Dublin boy with port. And you? I don't drink. I'll fill your glass with water. The guard stood up. Stand up, said one. We stood up. Gentlemen, the king and the section commander. He shouted the toast as if his loyalty had been questioned. It rang tensely like a confession of faith. The prisoners drank with the guard. I sat down. The four men kicked aside the chairs and came over to me. One of them swung me around by the shoulder and drew his gun. The others had their guns out. They were cursing. Why didn't you drink the king's health? You bastard, shouted the section commander. Why? 
He's not my king. That doesn't matter. The other two drank, and by God, you're going to. Here, take it. He shoved the water of glass into my hand. The water splashed on the floor. He struck the gun up the back of my neck. That's the stuff, said the swarthy Osgy, who had previously pointed me out as a bad egg. He was leaning against the mantelpiece. Put the swine through it. A tall officer with a Sam Brown strap slanted across the greenish-black uniform, strode in. What's the row? I heard some shouting outside. That swine won't drink the king's health, said he. He turned to me. Is that true? It is. Why do you refuse? I'm a soldier of the Irish Republican Army, and I owe no allegiance to your king. He looked at me. He held out his hand. Shake hands, he said. We gripped each other's hands firmly. He turned to the guard. The anger was going out of their faces. You heard your orders, didn't you? The prisoners were to be treated well on Christmas Day. My name is Major. I forget what the name was. If there's any more trouble, send for me. Now remember. He turned to the guard. The four came over to me. We shook hands, one after the other. I'm sorry, said the section commander. He put his hand on my shoulder. That's all right, I said. I'll drink your health. We raised glasses and drank together. So, you see, the sort of the, the the rough and tough, the civilian, uh, uh, and and what a, what the, our insight up into Ernie about all of this? Well, he's a young man. Um, he's got um, no family responsibility, and so he still feels very self confident about who he is and how he's going to stick for his principles. Um, he's willing to literally die for them. Um, uh, he could have given false answers but he knew that that would have gotten him in greater difficulty. And so he just replies sort of, no. So here's a brave young man. Uh, he's got this, uh, 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 and yet he has this capacity to be civil. And his perception of uh, the opposition, no matter whether they're torturing him or in their capacity as just human beings, he has a, an attitude toward them. So, next month, join us for Life in Kilmainham Jail.